from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, the senior pastor, and I want to thank you for watching today's broadcast. Now, I invite you to join in the worship of God.
Friends, good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Sundermeyer. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Welcome to this second hour of worship on this last Sunday of Epiphany, the last Sunday before we begin uh, the Lenten season. So grateful that you've decided to join uh, in worship today, whether you're worshiping uh, live stream or you're worshiping on demand uh, on one of our various channels or platforms later on in the week. We're so grateful uh, to count you as a worshiper today, uh, to share in worship uh, remotely today. Uh, we are hopeful as uh, the COVID numbers in Atlanta and Fulton County continue to decline. We are hopeful to be back uh, in worship, uh, in person, having an in-person option sometime soon. And while a date has not yet been set, uh, set rather, for our return, uh, we do anticipate some information uh, in the coming days to be released from our task force and from our uh, session. Thank you for your continued uh, diligence and, and patience and faithfulness in this time and all the ways we've been able to connect as one church, even as we're uh, across the city, across the state, across the country, and in some cases, even across the world. We're, we're glad to remember and pleased to remember that we are one church in and through Jesus Christ. If you are with us for the first time, I'd invite you uh, to take out your cell phone and to check in. Our uh, text message check-in platform is pretty easy. There's a banner right now on the screen that gives you some information on how to do that. If you've never used it before, you're going to text the phrase first. That's the number 1ST to the number 313-131. That's 1ST, text that to the number 313-131. If you've used this before, you will simply text the phrase check-in to that same number, 313-131. Check-in to 313-131. You'll also see that on your screen as well. As I mentioned, uh, this is the final Sunday before we begin the Lenten season. Lent begins each and every year with Ash Wednesday. Um, we have two opportunities for worship and reflection. Uh, to prepare ourselves for that day uh, and to prepare ourselves for the Lenten season. First, know that we are going to have a live stream only service broadcast from the sanctuary uh, Wednesday night at 7.30. That will include uh, a time to celebrate communion. And so in preparation for that, as we have done in the past, we encourage you to get some sort of drink and some sort of uh, edible item to celebrate alongside the pastors and with the pastors as we break bread and share the cup in the sacrament of communion. Also on Ash Wednesday, we do have an in-person opportunity for those who feel comfortable in participating in it. Uh, so far, the weather looks like it will hold up. We are going to have pastors in the Memorial Garden from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The Memorial Garden faces Peachtree Street. You can park in our lot across the street from the church, cross at the crosswalk, and come between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. We'll encourage you to keep your mask on. The pastors will have their masks on. And if you'd like, we will impose ashes upon you, uh, speaking the traditional words of Ash Wednesday, from dust you have come and to dust you shall return. We will put it on your forehead or on your hand. If you do not want the pastor to touch you in that way, we have prepared uh, personalized ash containers that you can impose the ashes yourself, such as life in COVID-19, that we would have personalized uh, ash containers that you can uh, put on yourself and hear the words from the pastor. We'll also pray for you and provide a blessing for you as well. Again, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. throughout that whole day, an opportunity to uh, enter this season with the imposition of ashes. Uh, two more uh, announcements that I want to bring to your attention. One is very acute, uh, and it is a need that has come up in this particular season in the life of community ministries. As many of you know, it is tax season, and we expect that we will help file about 100 people's tax returns through our community ministries. And to put it very plainly, we are short-staffed. Uh, and so we're looking for volunteers who meet two criteria, well, three really, that you can be on campus 
on Monday or Wednesday between the hours of 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. That's number one. Number two, you have some level of comfort in navigating a tax return. And three, here's a big one, that you have to be uh, nimble and comfortable with doing it online because all of these returns will be done online. If you fit that description and you would like to serve uh, in this particular way, I'd ask you to email me or ask anybody you know on the staff, and we will make the necessary connections with those who are leading this project of helping file tax returns for about 100 people through our community ministries. Uh, thank you in advance for, for saying yes to that opportunity. Finally, uh, this time of year, and this particular Sunday each and every year, uh, during worship, we would invite our pre-K children to the front to receive their Bibles during the liturgy. Obviously, we're not doing that uh, at this time, but those uh, students, those children, uh, have received or will receive their pre-K Bibles uh, this week. And so I want to read their names. We would uh, celebrate them. We would pray for them and their households and their families. Uh, so I do want to lift their names up so you can be in prayer for them uh, during this week. And if some of them are watching, it's really cool to hear your name read uh, on the live stream. William Boone Arms, Mary Benson Barber, Grace Lucy Chatton, Anna Francis Davis, Cullen Mitchell Davis, Clark Douglas Dorr, Berkeley Given, Jack Ephraim Lewis, Ren Ayers Logue, Piper Lynn McBurnett, Vivian Henley Naglich, Harrison Wendell Renninger, Alexander Crawford Reynolds. We're so thankful for each one of these children and their families. We do love you and pray for you in these days. Well, friends, let us now prepare our hearts for the worship of God as we wait on the choir for our choral in Troy. Friends, would you join me in the call to worship, no matter where you are? Lord, you have called us to the mountaintop. Help us to look forward to where you would have us go. Help us to listen carefully to the words of your healing love. Open our hearts and spirits to receive your glorious directions. Place your trust in the Lord in all your ways. Lord, we worship you and give you our lives.
Amen. Friends, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But the good news is that when we confess our sin, our God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness again and again and again. Trusting, believing, hoping in this, we pray together, confessing our sin, the ways in which we have separated ourselves from God and neighbor. Let us pray. God, we confess that on this Transfiguration Sunday, we are very much not ready to have you draw near to us for the 40 days of Lent. We see you in your glory. We see you on the mountaintop, and we want to build these dwellings for you and your prophets to stay with us in that glorious light, in that holy otherness. God, in these times of praise, it is hard to look for the time when you will draw even closer to us, less like the Christ part of your title and more like the Jesus part. As we prepare to know more of your humanness, more of your in-touchness with who we are, may we be ready in our hearts to prepare ourselves for knowing who you are for us, knowing ourselves and how we can be better humans with and for you. And so we pause for a moment to consider the ways we might prepare our hearts to come down from the mountain and journey with you in the wilderness. Amen. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the sound of my pleadings. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. So I am helped and my heart exalts. And with my song, I give thanks to him. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. On behalf of the session, I present Penelope Ann Olson to receive the sacrament of baptism. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always until the end of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. Tiago and Taylor, in presenting Poppy for baptism, you announce your own faith in Jesus Christ and that you desire Poppy to know God, to love God, and to serve God. So please show your purpose by answering these questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you renounce your sin and reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Yes. 
If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you promise to participate actively with your child in the life of the congregation and to bring up your child in the ways of the Lord, praying with and for Poppy? If so, say, I do. I do. Poppy will be received into Christ's church, and this congregation has a role in her nurture. To that end, do you promise, with God's help, to support her parents by, by providing opportunities for service, worship, and study? And do you promise to love Poppy and to assist her in becoming a faithful follower of Jesus Christ? If so, please respond by saying, we do. We do. Please join me as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the common elements of the earth. And in this sacrament, we're especially grateful for the element of water so necessary to our living, to this planet's living, for our refreshment, to clean us, to renew us, to strengthen us. And we pray that this water, which is common and ordinary, would be set aside, and may it be a sign and a symbol for Poppy, for her parents and grandparents, all who love her, and may it be a sign for your whole church that you love us, that you've claimed us and have called us your own. And for that, we say thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it wasn't that long ago that we were here celebrating your wedding. And now, what a joy it is to celebrate Poppy's baptism. And so I ask, what is the Christian name of this child? Hi, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. Poppy, I love you. Penelope Ann, daughter of God, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may Father, God, Son, and Holy Spirit live inside of you this day and every day ahead. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I wish you could be here in person to see sweet Poppy. The camera will have to do until we get to meet her one day in the nursery or in Sunday school at a service when she tries to take off your mask. But we thank God for precious gifts like these that remind us that we are loved and cared for and called beloved children of God. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for sweet Poppy. We thank you for her parents and her grandparents, everyone who loves her, for this church who will love her, who is committed to loving her. We ask, oh God, that you would raise in her a spirit after your own, that one day through that spirit she would, with her own lips, confess that you are Lord and Savior of her life and trust in you for all things. Bless this family. Bless this little one. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. There you go. It's great to see you guys.
first reading this morning comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
One of the most beautiful hymns of the church that tells a story that Andrew just read for us. A story that is set for, for us, uh, before us on this Sunday each and every year, this Transfiguration Sunday. Alongside of it is a text from the Gospel of Mark, the ninth chapter, verses 2 through 9. Continue to listen to God's word to you and to me. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And, and Jesus was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking to Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, uh, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, break open your word afresh to us this day so that we may see you in a different light, that we may hear you in a different way, that we could even be surprised, challenged, changed by what we see and hear. Even as we make preparations for the Lenten journey ahead, would you show up and reveal yourself to us? We pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, when I was a, a preteen, I remember how interested I was uh, to see where my parents worked. My father was a, a mid-level salesman for a company called Proctor and Schwartz. They manufactured and, and sold drying systems for processing chemicals and and synthetics and pharmaceuticals and even food. I thought it was super cool that the cereal I ate every morning was dried by one of the machines that my father sold. Uh, his office was in uh, the northwest suburbs of Philadelphia. My mother worked for E.F. Hutton, which eventually became uh, Lehman Brothers, and many of us know what happened to them in 2008. But when she worked for them, her office was in Center City, Philadelphia, in a high-rise called the Darth Vader Building because it was tall and shiny and completely and totally black. It was at 16th at Market Streets, right in the heart of the city. And while I only got a chance uh, on, on a few occasions to visit their places of employment, I remember those experiences I had uh, with a, a level of fondness because when you're a kid, when you're a kid and you only see your parents in the context of your home, and when you only know them as mom and dad, something expands and enlarges in your mind as you see them relate to other people, as you witness them doing meaningful work, as you watch them take on important responsibilities that have absolutely nothing to do with you. It's completely and totally outside of your orbit. So in retrospect, what intrigued me wasn't so much the physical locations of where they worked, but what intrigued me was who they were in those contexts. In a way, when I visited them, I got to see more of who they were as people, not just as my parents, but I got to see them more as human beings. A big part of them, which I wasn't regularly privy to, uh, was revealed to me. I got to see an aspect of their life which I didn't 
often get to see, and that made me feel closer to them. It created a, a deeper level of intimacy because they were willing to reveal more of who they were. As a kid, I wouldn't have had the, the language I just used, but now I can say, even as it was such a, a simple act of them bringing me to their workplaces, that act of them taking me to work was actually an expression of their love for me. I wanted to see more of who they were, and they were willing to show me. I got to see them in a completely and totally different light that created a deeper connection between us. Well, you all know that today is, is Valentine's Day and romance and intimacy and friendship all correspond to what I've just described. When you're starting a relationship, we know that the way it will grow, we also know this is the way it might end, but we're gonna keep it on the positive. The way it might grow is through self-revelation. The way it grows is through self-disclosure. When you let somebody else in, when you reveal yourself to them, when you share your feelings, when you share your passions and your interests, when you share your faith, when you share what you care about, when you share your vision and your hope, when you share the good stories and the traumatic stories that have marked and shaped your life, when you do that in a relationship, any relationship, intimacy grows. And intimacy will continue to grow as we risk sharing more of who we are and the other risks sharing more of who they are with us. I remember when Katie, my wife, and I were, were dating, she invited me to a Thursday night Bible study that her retired Baptist pastor grandfather led with about 12 seniors, many of them octogenarians, people in their 80s. We were in our mid-20s at the time, and this wasn't usual for a mid-20-something to be attending a Bible study on a Thursday night with this particular cohort. But Katie had committed to it each and every week. And as we started to date, she invited me to attend. And the reason she invited me to attend is because she wanted me to meet somebody she cared about and people that she cared about. She wanted to invite me to see more of who she was and how important her faith was to her. And I got to see in real time Katie love on and relate to that group of people. And what it actually did was grow my love for her. As she revealed more of herself to me, our intimacy grew. She wanted me to see her in a different light, which deepened our connection. Well, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, with all of its rich and mysterious theological meaning and depth, is really a story of self-disclosure. It's really a story of self-revelation, which makes it a story of love. What is disclosed is, is not just for the eyes and the ears of Peter, James, and John, but for all of us who dare to pay attention to this story that shows up right in the middle of Mark's gospel. For those of us who have ears to hear and eyes to see, I would suggest that this act of self-disclosure, this act of self-revelation from Jesus should be received as an expression of God's love for us. That God wants us to see more of who God is. Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh, the very Word of God, who is God incarnate through divine agency and divine will, reveals more of who he is to the ones he loves. He wants them and he wants us to see him in a different light. He wants us to see him with Moses and Elijah. He wants us to know that his ministry has continuity with the law and the prophets. 
He wants us to hear the voice that comes from heaven. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. He wants us to remember his baptism. And with a radiant white light, he foreshadows his own glorious resurrection. This is an astounding and powerful and beautiful moment of self-revelation. And it's motivated by love. God reveals God's self to us in this way to deepen our connection with God so that we would come to know more of God, more of Jesus Christ, more of the Holy Spirit, more of who God is. And so we, along with Peter, James, and John, have this opportunity today to see Jesus in a different light, to see him in a different way. And so I, I, I wonder, no matter the circumstances of your life, no matter where you find yourself right now, on a mountaintop or uh, in the valley, how is Christ wanting you to see him differently? How is Christ wanting you to see him differently? What does Christ wants you to know of him in these days? What is being revealed to you that you haven't seen yet or you haven't heard yet or perhaps what you have refused to see of him or what you've refused to hear him speak? How might you see Jesus in a different light in the living of your days right now? A component of, of this text that, that's really interesting to me is how one of Peter's first instincts, remember Mark tells us that they were afraid and they didn't know what to do. So he kind of leans into a basic instinct of his. It's a religious instinct. What he does is that he marks that moment or he wants to mark that moment as sacred, right? He wants to mark time and space as sacred and he wants to do it by constructing dwelling places, little tabernacles, little churches, little worship dwellings for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And while there are different ways of interpreting Peter's motives here, one interpretation that's always intrigued me was the way in which he wanted to stay on the mountain. Right, to build these dwelling places, to mark that space and that time as sacred, infers to us that he plans on dwelling there, that he plans on staying there for some time. He wanted to dwell in the holiness and the sacredness of that moment, and who could blame him? But Mark tells us that that moment ends abruptly and that the story moves down the mountain as the disciples follow Jesus. Jesus will call him, call them rather, to follow him as they make their way to Jerusalem. This is why this text appears on the Sunday before the season of Lent, because it's all about the beginning of that journey, a journey that will take Jesus to the cross. And so if we're gonna see Jesus, if we're gonna set ourselves up to see Jesus in a different light, we have to acknowledge that we are sometimes like Peter, right? That we often assume we know or discern or understand who God already is and what God wants. Naturally, what God wants is for me to build dwellings, to mark this time as sacred and this space as holy. Right? It, it, it translates into our day-to-day -day living and our day-to-day -day faith. So often we show up in faith and in life not as learners or sojourners in the quest to receive God's revelation or God's activity in our lives or in the life of the world, but oftentimes we show up as ones who have already figured it out, who already know what we should do who already understand or who already know all we need to know about God and about what God desires. And we take that certainty. And we take that certainty and we, we look for people and we look for, for voices and we look for communities that affirm what we already think. 
what we already believe about Jesus or about the world, about who's in and who's out. If we're gonna see Jesus in a different light, if we're gonna put ourselves in a place to see him in a different way, then we have to leave room to be wrong. We have to leave room to be surprised, to be cor corrected, to be critiqued, to be challenged or changed in relationship to what it is we want to do or what we believe or how we should go. We have to be open to the possibility that what I think doesn't always align with the mind of God and what I want does not always align with the desire of God. Even when I have good intentions, good instincts like the instinct of Peter, there's nothing wrong with marking time. I have to leave room for the possibility that Jesus can show himself to me and to this world in a different light, and then I have to act accordingly. Instead of building dwellings, I come down the mountain. I have to be ready to be surprised. I have to be ready to change course. I have to be ready to let go of what I hold on to so that I may be free to hold the very hand of God. Father Greg Boyle is a, is a Jesuit priest. He lives in Los Angeles. He founded a, a ministry called Homeboy Industries. And, and the ministry's mission is to provide hope and training and support to formerly gang-involved and formerly incarcerated men and women, allowing them a moment of self-sufficiency so that they can redirect their lives and become contributing members of the community. And for over 30 years, Father Greg has led this ministry. And during those three decades, the, the tide of gang activity in Los Angeles has turned. The field of reentry services has uh, only enlarged and, and public safety has become more enlightened in ways that would not have been possible without the advocacy of Homeboy Industries and Father Greg's pastoral and prophetic leadership. In one of his books, Barking to the Choir, I love that title, Barking to the Choir, I recommend it to you. He tells this story. He talks about a woman who came to him who was really determined to join his efforts at Homeboy. And she came to him and she said, Father Greg, I have to volunteer with you. I can do nothing else. I have to be a volunteer. Father Greg was intrigued by her compulsion that she needed to volunteer. And so he asked, why is it that she feels so compelled to participate in this work? And she replied quickly, because I believe I have a message for these young people. In other words, I believe I have what these young people actually need to hear. Father Greg responded with a gentleness, but, but also with a strength. He said to her, the minute that you lose that message, come back to us. He said, because we don't point the cursor at some lost soul and, and push the save button. Many volunteers long accustomed to building the orphanage or, or feeding the homeless in a soup kitchen ask me what they're supposed to do and I always answer wrong question. The right question is, what will happen to me here? What will happen to me here? If we're going to see Jesus in a different light, we'll have to loosen our grip on our self-righteousness and our finalized and immovable certainty of who Jesus is and only, in our opinion, can be. We not only have to let him come down off the mountain, but we have to get behind him and follow him, for that's what he wants to do. In his autonomy and his freedom, he wants to walk the road of faithfulness and obedience that will eventually lead to the cross. And he asks us to take up our cross and follow him. He asks us to pay attention to his way of service and his way of sacrifice and his way of love. He asks us to see his obedience and to expect something to happen to us when we follow him along the way. 
He invites us to come down from the mountain of self-assurance and self-righteousness and to pay attention to who he is revealing himself to be in this mysterious and difficult journey to the cross and who he will be in the often mysterious and difficult way and journey of life. And so, brothers and sisters in the faith, uh, we embark on this Lenten road. May we be open to what may happen to us along the way. May we loosen our grip on what we want to do and be open to what God is calling us to do. Maybe it's not time to build dwellings. Maybe it's time to come down the mountain and follow him. May we show up in that journey as learners and sojourners who might actually be surprised by what we discover. And may we be ready to see Jesus in a different light, to see what will happen to us when we do. And may his light change us and illumine this way of obedience as we come down off the mountain and journey with him to Jerusalem, even to the cross, even to the empty tomb. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's join together once again in prayer. God, as we look around in this world today, sometimes it's disheartening because we think that the things in front of us are who we are. We think that division and hopelessness and wondering and wandering, peacelessness, conflict, illness, death, we think that's who we are. 
But oh God, you have shown us that that is not who we are. You have shown us through who you are that our identity is in you. You have shown us who you are in how we have walked behind you and followed you. You have shown us who we are when we acknowledge each other's suffering in empathy. You have shown us who we are and who you are when we pray. You have shown us who you are and who we are when we do simple things like wearing a mask, calling up a friend, reaching out, handing a meal to someone, making sure that your children are taken care of in whatever ways we can. And we pray that as we continue to journey through this, what seems like a year of Lent, we pray that you will help us see more of who you are each day. Lord, as we pray and hope to see more of who you are, we still see more of who we are in ways that maybe you don't want us to, or maybe you do. God, we pray that you will help us see the darkness so that we can see your transfiguration. We, help, we ask your help in our journey towards peace and wholeness and wellness again. And so today we turn our eyes toward our neighbors and we pray for those who are hungry and lonely and sick. We pray for those who are injured, for those who are awaiting test results, for those who are lying in wait of your hand to guide them to the next world. Lord, we pray for those outside of our immediate community. We pray for those around the world who are suffering in ways that we here can only imagine. We pray for our friends in Cuba, that they may have access to food and clean water and health. We pray for our friends in Jamaica and Kenya and Brazil, that they may soon receive the vaccines that we are now so quickly receiving. We pray for our friends in Haiti who are continuing to minister in a time of turmoil. We pray that all dictatorships, all irresponsible leaders, all those who don't look to you for their leadership and guidance, we pray that those will end. We pray for people in Myanmar today as they continue to protest and continue to fight for democracy in ways that you have guided them to do. And we pray that in our own lives, we may forever turn our eyes to you so that we may see more and more of who you are each and every day and know that who we are is really more like you than we thought. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, as we embark on this Lenten journey and this Lenten season, let us open our eyes to see Jesus in a different light. Let us not automatically lean into our own instincts in this season, but, but to be aware, to stay awake, to pay attention to where he's leading. Whatever that mountain you need to come down from, come down and follow him in this season to the cross and in anticipation to that empty tomb. And for the journey that is ahead, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. May his peace live inside of you this day and every day ahead. Amen and be at peace.
thank you for watching today's broadcast. For more video content, I'd encourage you to visit our website, firstpressatl.org. We'd love to see you here sometime at the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street to join us for worship. Thanks again for watching.